and welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with Daniel and Daniel. And today we are going to go over our board game breakdown, where what this is, is we take either a designer, a game, a publisher, or a mechanism, and we break it down to everything we can talk about it. Today we're going to focus on our designer, Prospero Hall, which technically isn't just one designer, is it? Not really. They're a group of designers um, that have formed to come out and that's why they push out so many games within a year because it's not just one guy doing one game it's a group of them doing four games a year yeah and not only that they do art for it as well like it's just a it's a full design firm basically where i think the only thing that they don't do in-house is publish i don't think they actually print the games so like they create the games they make the rule books make sense they get all the components ready all of the art all of the assets ready and work with whatever IP I believe that they're working on at the time. And then they go to a publishing company to print it. Like Ravensburger, I know they work with them quite often. Funkoverse, I think, owns them now. Yeah, Funkoverse, I believe, owns them. Yep. And we're going to be going over their history a little bit. And they've only been making games since 2016, actually, which is the first game that we'll, we'll be talking about. So not a very big span, but it's already came up with 77 titles, including here's expansions. Here's the thing about Prospero Hall, too. Uh, back in the day, uh, especially when you would hear about it, IPs would be something you didn't want to touch. And Fantasy Flight kind of put it on the map and made them better with their good games. Prospero Hall took that, that ball and ran with it. Yes, they and did. Now, and, and not only that, they made it kind of like a mass market appeal, too, because you see it in those big box stores such as Walmart and Target, and, and you're like, okay, okay, maybe I'll try this game out. And so you can actually see as their history goes along, they were that mass market company, the, the, some of the games that they came out with, and then all of a sudden they started doing IPs, and it, they just blew up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that's really when I started noticing them. The very first IP game that I noticed from them, I mean, it's not technically a, an IP, it's based on a likeness, was the Bob Ross game. Yeah. Because that was just such a bizarre concept of a, of a game. And then I ended up playing it years later, and it was good. It was actually good. And so we're, we'll are we be talking about that uh, pretty soon. Um, before we get started, is there anything else that you want to bring up about Prospero Hall? Like, where did you first notice them? first Prospero Hall game I played, and it's actually not on their list because I think they were under a different name at the time, but it was the Hogwarts Battle um, Harry Potter game. Harry yeah. Potter Hogwarts Battle? You'll see, yeah, you'll see their um, reprint of it basically on, on our list here. But yeah, um, the, the printing that I have of it actually says Prospero Hall, but originally they weren't uh, Prospero Hall. Yeah. The, well, there's also another uh, group called like Forest Puznam, I think, and yeah. they were very similar to it, and I, I don't know what the relation is exactly, if one acquired the other, or if they actually were just, like, another part of the same team, or... I know they're all based out of Seattle, and they've all kind of combined, and uh, so, so when, that's similar. Personally, but the Prospero Hall, for me personally, yeah, the Hogwarts Battle, but uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure game was another one that drew me in, mm-hmm. and then the one that actually got me really into them is Villainous. Disney's villainous is. I'm like, I started getting intrigued. Then you showed me, I think it was like Keeping It Sexy. They played that one pretty well. And then Horrified came out. And Horrified is the game that has, anytime Prospera Hall has something coming up, I'm like, I'm in. Yep. Yep. Same here. That was. Villainous was close, but. And then I started noticing the other games, but Horrified was hands down. That was the one where I'm like, all right, I'm in. Let's, let's play. Like, if Prospero Hall comes out with a new game, go on. <laughs> that's that's yeah, so effectively you, you, it. You can barely see my copy of Horrified. It's right over here. Yep. And mine is right there, I believe. There yeah. we go. As you're pointing out. And then you can't see it, or you can barely see it, but there's Keeping It Sexy. And I know I have a few more somewhere in here. The Shining is right behind my head right there. Because those are good co-op games. So... I'm going to jump over to our view right now. So let me do that. All right. We have right here. We're going to start with their about page on their website. It says, welcome to Prospero Hall. 
We are a collaborative game design studio in Seattle, Washington. Each of our projects starts with a vision, the kind of game we want to make, the vibe, the look, and the feel, and the reason for it to exist. Then, the ga game design through graphic design to writing, painting, sculpting, engineering, and music score. We do whatever it takes and sweat every day, or every detail, to make the best game we can, fun to play, and something you're very proud of to have on your table. We hope you enjoy our games. And that, that's a very simple about page. Um, let, then it has a team page where it goes over a lot of the team of graphic designers uh, and game designers. So now I think I might have met a few of these people before as far as like going to the Gamma Trade Show or Origins. But as far as I remember, I don't exactly remember that. So we have like Jay Wheatley, uh, Deidre Cross, Jessica Assetti. Those are the, the main people, the leadership. If you actually want to see the, the developers, you have to scroll down a bit. Yep. Then we have Operations, Manufacturing, and License. So they handle mainly the licensing of all the games. I'm, I'm just going to let you read all the, all of these for our audio viewers. Well, I guess uh, I might as well say them. Lisa Cidio, Dan uh, Dusilovich. Forgive me if I say any of these wrongs. Mike Nally, Rosie fisher Sargent. Matisse Fletcher, Cassandra Whitaver. Then down here we have marketing, Adam Minton, Stephanie Straw, Paul Compte, or Comte, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see here. Then we have production development. So this is overall production, if I'm not mistaken. This isn't just yeah. uh, designing the games. These are making sure everything's good. So we have <coughs> Jennifer uh, Schneeweiss. Schneeweiss? Yeah. Jennifer, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. I apologize. I'm sure I did. Uh, Ruby. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to go by their first names at this point. Corby. Lindsay. Uh, Wisniewski. Wisniewski. Okay. Uh, Lindsay. Tokuda. Nicole uh, Jekic. Sean Neal. Danny Cork. And Luke Turpinen. Turpinen? That's what I'm going to go with. Yeah, and then now we have actually game development, which is, this is of course my wheelhouse, because I'm, I'm a game developer as well, and I think what these guys are doing all together is, is fantastic. So we have Brian Kirk, Peter Lee, Aaron Dono. Dono what? I don't know how to spell say his name. Dexter uh, Stevens. Chris Rollins. Matt Christensen. Nate Wiseman. And Ket I, I know there's a way to pronounce that. I just don't know how to pronounce it. Um, uh, Cause like uh, the the name N G U Y E N is actually Win. So yeah, yeah. So Ket, forgive us on that one. Yeah. Of course, I feel like I'm gonna say forgive us, forgive us. But just know, that, like obviously we don't know how to pronounce the names. But then we go into visual and 3D design. So this is like some of the art directors and whatnot. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. This is one of the things that I, I really do enjoy what these guys and girls are doing because of like something as simple as like The Shining when you open it up and then you have, you know, the the hotel and then you open up the board to the next side and it's a hotel under snow. Oh my God. Like what they do is so solid on this. So. The box cover is the famous carpet from the movie. Right, exactly. And it's, oh, it's gorgeous. So we have Josh Manderville. Alex Fairyland. Tyler Hill. Alan Etch Etchison. Scott V. Hill. Dylan Aldane. Thomas Ramey. Drew Barr. Ernest Zeigenfelder. Corwin Waldron. All right. So amazing crew right there. So that's a mm -hmm. big team. Like, I mean, it's not, it's not something that you could just <laughs> simply say, oh, well, this is the designer. I get why they go by the name Prospero Hall now. Is because yeah. this is one giant team design They're firm working as a group. Yeah, right? just individual. It's not like a Stefan Feld or a Phil Walker Harding. This is an entire group of people. Exactly. And so what they've been doing, I really <laughs> like how they've been taking these IP games or even non-IP games and making it something that's that's it. I their goal. I read this in an interview with one of them uh, before when they were talking about the new Back to the Future game. Their ultimate goal is to make a game that they would want to play, 
but that anybody else could. Like, so, like, an, a non-gamer could pick up their games and play it no it's problem. Uh, Horrified is probably one of my favorite games and is in my top five games just because of that reason. It's such a simple game. I can teach it to my non-gaming family members, and they would still be able to gain the grasp of it. Oh, yeah. Because you do so many actions, you do a bad thing, and you're done. Yeah, and exactly. Oh, man. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think it's it was in German, but I wouldn't be surprised if Horrified was nominated for the Spiel. Yeah, if I don't... Well, Robin Zerberger is the one that printed it, so I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't German rules for it. Yeah, there probably is. So, let's go... Let's start by their game designs, and we're going to go by specifically listed as a designer so far. Uh, we'll look uh, briefly at artist and accessory designer later. But mm -hmm. we're going to start at the very beginning with Suspicion. I remember seeing this in Target. Um, it looked like a clue variant, but a lot more streamlined and apparently a lot better too. Have you seen Suspicion? Um, I remember seeing it in Target, but uh, if you notice the date on it, 2016, that's when we, I tried to ignore. I, I only went for like the games that I knew at Target. I tried to ignore. Right. Them. There's going to be another one we see up here called the Yeah No Game that has that that cover that changes <laughs> because of, like those pillows, and I, I avoided that. Um, now I'm interested in trying it out just to see how it is, but yeah. the suspicion I just kind of ignored, and now I'm interested to go back and see if I can ever find these, and just to see how they are. I know I've seen suspicion a couple times at thrift stores, and that's I shop at thrift stores quite often. Not at the moment, but in general I tend to, and I've always passed it off. I'm like, ah, it's just another, it's an unlicensed version of Clue, whatever. I never cared about it. Now, knowing that it's Prospero Hall, unfortunately, I'm going to have to get it next time I see it. Just, I, just to try it. I'm not saying, like, all their games are winners, but I'm saying everything I've played of theirs, I've enjoyed. There's a game that goes along this line of suspicion. It's a mass market game uh, that we'll talk about a little later called You Blew It. Yeah. You see that in the store, and you think, you know, okay, that's just a gimmick. That's just what they're trying. And then we played it, and I'm like, it's actually not a bad push your luck. Yeah. Yeah, it's really not bad at all. And so I'm going to also do a running count of how many of these games I actually own, <laughs> because why not? Um, go up to 2017, one of the first ones. That, this was a group of four games that I believe were all given at Target at the same time, and I remember seeing that they were all from Prospero Hall. The Wizard Always Wins. I have played it, I have been the wizard, and I did win. <laughs> But the idea of it is, it's very simple. You're just trying to get collections of different kinds of uh, potion material or resources in order to put your chips into the bag. Well, the thing is, you're trying to pull certain chips out of the bag and be the one where on, on the turn where you choose to be the wizard as the role, you want to be able to pull your token out of the bag. <laughs> and so, technically, yes, it's chance, but there's that little give and take of, at what point do I... Stop pushing my luck, and do I actually claim as the wizard and hope that I had enough to get tokens from the bag? It's really smart how the game works. Uh, let me see if I can pull up some pictures of it. Have you, you have not played this one, right? I have not played it. I've seen it a few times um, and have been intrigued by it, but yeah, I have not uh, played it yet. Yeah, you probably saw it, and, we, and this was before we knew the games by Prospero Hall. You yeah. Know. And before we were interested in it. But yeah, I like the turn order thing. Like, you choose one of your roles, and it's kind of worker placement in that aspect. If I choose, like, the, the fourth role, you can't pick that one. And so, just different ways of building up your magic level, how many tokens you can draw from the bag, or which tokens you add to the bag, or which ones you can manipulate. It's, it's super smart how it works. So, that was the wizard always wins. And with that being said... Let's go up to the next one. I'm waiting for this to load on my end. Uh, this is now Sick, tw Sick and Twisted Charades. I don't think I've played this one or heard much of it. Nor have I. Um, I think this one is more... Um, hold on. Uh, looks like we're still stuck on... Uh, the Wizard Always Wins on Twitch. There we go. Okay. Looks like it's moving on, but I haven't heard about it. But it, to me, it sounds like an adult version of charades. Yeah, pretty much. And that that's how it can be perceived, right? Sick and twisted charades. Yeah, I'm going to pass that up because I probably wouldn't care for it. But now knowing that it's Prospero Hall, 
it's probably I'll have, to, I'll have to try it out yeah it's it's under the same realm uh or the umbrella of like banned words that looked like just a generic mass market i'm gonna or i'm gonna say dirty words and stuff but no it's actually a, apparently from what i've seen a very smart game yeah no um i actually almost bought it at one time and this is before i knew it was prospero hall just because i heard good recommendations for it on reviewers yeah all right, let's go over to Shifty Eyed Spies. Now, I have owned this one. I don't own it anymore because the goal of the game is you are Shifty Eyed Spies, of course. You are trying to get uh, a secret partner and you're trying to get them to go to a certain location. And you have a few location standees in the middle of everybody. And at some point before the end of your turn you have to give like a wink or a nod or an expression of some kind to uh the player that is your secret partner and and you have to also gesture somehow towards the building that they need to pick on their turn if they do it correctly or i know i'm sorry you have to figure out what building that they have as your secret partner if you're able to figure that out on your turn, you guess the building, the drop-off spot, and if so, you and your partner, your secret partner, get points. Um, it's very similar to a game that was released a couple years before that called Wink, and where it's the same idea. It's like you, like you have a set of cards and you have to wink or gesture or something to the other player. Um, I personally didn't like it that much because I didn't like the extra level of like, if you're my partner, Daniel, and I wink at you, or I, I, I gesture towards you, you have to then, uh, gesture towards the building. All of this while nobody is getting caught, but then at the same time, everybody's watching everybody and it's, it, it, it creates a fun space, but it doesn't work as fluidly as wink and therefore I didn't like it as much. It's understandable. I haven't played this one. It's another one of those games that I saw and just kind of walked away from. Yeah. I'm intrigued to try it. Again, Prospero Hall doesn't necessarily mean I'll like it. And like I said, doesn't mean I'm going to like all the Prospero Hall games. Yeah. There's always going to be games that I won't like. Um, but it's just that because it's Prospero Hall, I'm intrigued by what is going on. Yeah, definitely. Have you played Wink? No, I have not. Okay. All right. Yeah, then we don't have quite as, quite as much of a groundwork to go off of, but... Let's look at now, let's go to still 2017, uh, How to Rob a Bank. Now this one I think you have played, right? We have played this one, yes. Yes. What, did, what are I your thoughts on this? I, I really enjoyed it. I, I don't remember too, too much of it. I remember you picked it up, I think, um, in one of your runs to Tucson. Uh, and you brought it home and we tried it. I, and I enjoyed it. Um, if I'm going to play something like this, I'll probably play Stop Thief over anything, but... Um, this to me was a really fun game. I know you're trying to not get caught by the guards. You're trying to get as much loot. You're trying to send the guards to the other player, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think one player plays the rob or um, one player plays the guards. Everybody else plays robbers. Yeah, yeah. And it's one versus one versus all. That's what what it is. If I yeah. Correctly. Yeah. It, this was a neat game. Um, I'm showing a picture right here. I don't know if this is the version I have or if this is a oh, the, this I is a remake. It must be, because that board looks absolutely phenomenal. I have the older yeah, version. Compared to what we played. Yeah, I mean the version we had was fine. It was basically the board. It was yeah. Uh, it's, uh, or just the a board. Fourth picture. Yeah. It, uh, our fifth picture is just the board itself. Right. With the stacks on the side. Right, but I mean that that box cover. That's a really, really interesting way to do that. I like that. And honestly, I did enjoy the game for when we played it, but. <laughs> yeah, but it's not something that I'm gonna go out of my way to buy. I did enjoy it. It's a great Crest Barrel Hall game, and, and, and there's another game that we're gonna talk about that we both played that I'm not gonna go out of my way to buy, but I enjoyed playing it. All right, yeah, we'll we'll be talking about that soon then. Um, Konex. Uh, I this one. Yeah, I've only seen the the Dice Tower review of it. Uh, basically, the concept sounds really cool. You're overlaying the cards, like like with corners overlapping other cards. <laughs> And so it's kind of like this 3D, like, I want to say, like, set collection or gin rummy style thing. Uh, I haven't played it, but that's what it seems like. It looks intriguing. I, I really like that graphic design concept. 
I wouldn't mind trying it. Yeah. There's a game that got you pushed off a hall on your map in a game that I have not played yet. Yeah. I mean, this is this was the talk when everybody went to Target and was like, hey, look at all these good games and look at all these mass market games. And then what in the world? <laughs> Bob oh, Ross? Ross? What? Who would make a game after that? Well, so let's talk about how it works. I ended up buying this what I thought was a joke. I bought this at a thrift store. It was it was a few bucks. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll try it for a few bucks. What's the worst that'll happen? No, it's solid. It is a good game. Basically, it's hand management. You are going to be placing cards on this palette that have, uh, you'll play them as their paint color. You'll see in this picture, each of the three different uh, pictures or features have a certain number of uh, paint and different colors, whichever ones that make it. So like the little fluffy clouds will have uh, these specific colors and it'll also show what kind of brush you need. Well, each of the cards are either a paint color or a brush style. I believe there's probably one of each combination. And when you play them on your palette, you have to use the correct colors. Meaning if I'm trying to get this green, blue, white, and yellow, I can't have an orange color on my pa on the same palette because then it will just mess everything up, which makes sense, right, in art? Yeah. And then the sooner you do it, the more bonus points you get. Well, the, the idea is you're trying to get points by completing these features also before Bob Ross does. Because if you paint it before he does, you get bonus points as well. And, oh man, this is really just a super calming game. The first player to get to, I think, 25 chill win wins. <laughs> you know, it's really simple. And every turn you put over a Bob Ross card and then roll the Bob Ross die and it's super chill and it has like inspirational quotes from him. It's so ridiculous, so over the top, but really, really fun. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm intrigued to try this one. Yeah, it's... It's a solid set collection game. I was really impressed by it. So I'm going to have to bring it over. I And it comes with an easel. It comes with an easel. How amazing is that? Oh, man. Yeah, so Bob Ross, Art of Chill. Highly, highly encourage it. It's awesome. Banned words and yeah, nope. Let's talk about those real quick. Uh, again, banned words I almost picked up. I wanted to grab it. It was on sale just... Ended up buying something else when it was there on clearance. Uh, I think I can't remember what I. I think I ended up getting the um, Choose Your Own Adventure game uh, instead of Band Words. Okay. And yeah, nope. Uh, I looked at it. And I'm like, yeah, nope. I don't want to play it. But I'm just looking at the BGG ranking. And so for people who aren't familiar with Board Game Geek, anything above a six tends to be a relatively good game on this yeah. ranking system because there's so many people that end up voting on it. And at a 6.2, that's that's an interesting for yeah, nope. Yeah, I will because point out that it's 18 you... plus as well. Yes. Uh, but any, uh, with yeah, nope, it makes you think, yeah, no, I mean, it's a mass market game, I'm going to avoid it. But it's Prosperity Hall, and now I'm like, I may have to try it. Yeah, right? Yeah, the sequin box is, is so ridiculous. So here's the description of it. The sequin drenched box is almost as irresistible as the tell-all game, where players must guess what happened and how. Have you told off a boss? Made out with someone in a closet? Players work together to build a story and speculate using situation cards until the moment of the truth is revealed and s with the swipe of the gold bo sequin box. Yeah or nope? You'll blush, you'll giggle, you'll gasp because you'll never know the whole truth. That's... Interesting. You the use box the box... Is actually part of the game. Yeah, it's a component thing. So, it says over here under Mechanisms, it's a cooperative and push-your-luck game. Also, uh, bluffing. Yeah, humor, bluffing, and party games. So, I don't know. I'm intrigued. I mean, if I can find it for relatively cheap, yeah, I'll try it. I don't know if I want to pay the full price for it, especially since I don't know if it would stay in my uh, collection. Just because I, I try not to be too adult-oriented with my board games. So that's why right. I don't own Cards Against Humanity. Um, I think... My cards, uh, Apples to Apple clone, is the the Deadpool game. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the most risque game you own, I imagine. Yeah, I think... I really have risque games. Ah, so now, here's the question for you. I have a bit of trivia. Do I own Cards Against Humanity? You probably do now. 
Mm, technically, yes. I have the printout <laughs> version. <laughs> so banned words, from what I understand, is like it's more of a clue game. Like you're given a category and you yeah, ban a few uh, words. With banned words, if I remember correctly, you work in a team, so you're trying to say words that aren't be aren't allowed to be said. This way, your partner can guess the word, but you want to be careful with what you say because so the other team knows words and they're saying so if you say one of their words uh you get in trouble for it it's basically a negative for you because they ban certain words for you to try to give a clue to what you're trying to get your partner to guess yeah which is pretty cool i mean i, I there's another game that came out around the same time called trap words by cge i believe and that one was that that had a lot of oh well if you, if I'm trying to say, or if you're trying to say the clue cow, I'm going to put trap words as milk, utter, you know, farm, maybe. So I'm actually Beef. on the, the page for band words, and it says, need to get their, t uh, band words, players need to get their teammates to guess five secret words or phrases while avoiding traps set by the opposing team. Yeah. But you can only guess what those traps might be. Ah, uh, I see. Yep. Well, it's, it's slowing down on my load. That's that's fine. We'll come back to it later. Um, let's talk about You Blew It and Push. Two very similar games. Uh, both push your luck, no? They are both push your luck, and they're both very similar where you're drawing cards and either choosing to keep going or or possibly busting. Uh, in You Blew It, you are, your game, if you draw the same suit, I believe, is what you've had already, then you bust. Let's see here. Yeah. Um, and then there's times where, like, the fire and the hole cards, those might blow up certain ones. I like the the um, TNT-style dice that are included in it. I think that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so, yep, here's a picture of it. My, my only issue with Yacht Blew It, and this is just a nitpick, understand why they did it, but I hate the, di or the dynamite that it comes in. <laughs> Oh, Just the tube. I hate awkward shaped packaging because it's hard to put on the shelf. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. I still have my copy, but here's here's the problem I had with it. The cardstock does not have any kind of plastic coating or anything oh, good, know, yeah. and it's really flimsy, and it the, the cards feel like they're sticking together constantly. You can't mm -hmm. shuffle it well. I, I'm probably going to have to sleeve the cards just to make it usable. I do own it, and I proudly will own it because it's a really fun game it's a it's a good push your luck and then uh, on the twitch they're actually seeing the die uh that it's a dynamite so it's kind of cool yeah yeah definitely and then let's go to push which is also a similar game um on your turn you are going to be drawing cards that are numbered one through six placing them in in up to three piles the only thing is the same number or color cannot be in the same pile so if i drew uh, let's say another red card it would have to be in this third pile from here when you score them you score them as the sets of colors but if you bust or if you take one of the uh, push cards the ones with the die on it you roll the bad lie of doom as I call it and you discard all of the ones that are not safe of that color um, but what's cool though is you yeah you take one of the three piles so in this picture that I have on Twitch uh, this is obviously a game in progress I could choose to stop there, and I'd probably take the 3, 5, 2, and 1 and score them myself. But then going clockwise, the next player gets to pick another pile to take. So you want to you wanna try and get a good combination of stuff for your end, but you don't want to give your opponent so much more. And then, so this is obviously, it looks reminiscent to Uno, right? Yeah, it, um, it really does, but it, it's not. It, it, it's it's very know. different. Yeah. And so, I actually want to try this. This looks really fun. Yeah. Like, I love showing this to people who have played Uno, and I pull up that die, and I'm like, yeah, we have the die. And then they're like, great, what does that do? And they're thinking it's a wild, because it looks like a wild card. It's like, that's terrible. Here, you can have it. Because <laughs> you have to take it if you can. Um, if people don't remember, I know we had issues with it on the Twitch stream, but we did the Push Your Luck games mm -hmm. um, last Friday. This is a game that would have been on the list if I, if I had played it. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I I want you to play it. This is one that we can play over the internet. Easy. So, this will be definitely one of the ones. And this is probably... Th this pushes it... Pushes you blew it out 
for me just because of the component quality of you blew it i mean it's oh. yeah it's because of that alone all right let's move on up we have monster crunch bre the breakfast now, battle game i've heard good things about this i haven't played it myself and i want to but again i just kind of like really they came out with the push uh, monster crunch game so i avoided it because this is Prospero Hall hasn't really hidden my, at this time when it came out, my uh, wanting to play list, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, no, this is, this is like such a fun little, like, little card game. It's very simple. We just have like the numbers 1 through 10, I want to say. And uh, it's not loading on my end, but hopefully soon. Yeah, I'm, uh, I got mine loaded up. There we go. Yeah, so the idea of the game is you have your own set of cereal. You're going to be playing about 10 cards throughout the throughout the round, one at a time. And But the idea is that you can only play cards higher than the previous player or the same number. So if I play an 8, you can only play an 8, 9, or 10. But you can combine pairs of cards. So like two 6s would count as a 12. You could do that and, and combine them as a pair. But it's kind of like a whoever can shed their hand first is the winner of that round and you play over three rounds very simple you're trying to score the no the more cards you can score the better and so you have a lot of times where like i'll play a four then you'll play a four then i'll play a four then you'll play a five then i'll play a seven and you'll say crap <laughs> because i just made you like not able to play half of your cards <laughs> you know it's it's fun it's super fun I'll have to try it out. I mean, it looks like I can pick it up pretty well on uh, Amazon, so I might have to look into getting this. Yeah, this was a really good one. And this was under <laughs> Big G Creative, which... So, I'm not exactly sure what Big G Creative was, but I think what it was, was that was the original publishing name under what Prospero Hall did. Or at least, if not, it was a group that published a lot of those games. Like, well, so, yeah, Shifty Eyed you, Spies... Uh, you scroll up, you see that the designers were Forrest Pruz uh, Prusen Creative in Prospero Hall. So. Yep. So let's see what Big G Creative specifically is, since we're we're doing this. Uh, Heads Up Gaming. Okay. Yeah. So they are a publisher, and it looks like yeah, it looks like they are completely um, different than Prospero Hall, but they used a lot of Prospero Hall designs, and their first games really like Shifty Eyed Spies. How to uh, rob a bank. Yeah, How to Rob a Bank, Monster Crunch, Wizard Always Wins. Those were when I started seeing uh, Big G Creative. So they have 12 games on their list here. And oh, they did the Carpool Karaoke game. Oh, nice. Never played it. That is actually their most recent uh, game on here. They also did the Keeping It Sexy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Yep. Oh, oh and the one game I actually want to play on this list here. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll Bob talk Ross. about a little bit later. It's Prospero Hall. It's one of their more recent games. Yeah, definitely. All right, let's talk about Caro. Caro okay. is, a, is a really interesting game. I only know a little bit about it. It, it caught me by surprise because that cover tells me that that's like a pretty heavy Ameritrash game or a really unthematic uh, Euro. Euro, <laughs> yeah. And, but then the pieces are trains yeah, with, with timers in them. And the amount of kerosene that you have to burn is the timer you have. So it is a real-time game. Uh, let's see. It's a two-player game at that. Yeah. So it's a it's a cool strategy game. Let's see what it says. Uh, June 2471 and kerosene, Caro, is scarce. Two clans are struggling to survive, exploring new territories in their tanker trucks. Running out of fuel is a risk each time they leave camp. Fortunately, a local tribe of Tarex can lend a helping hand. Caro is a two-player game set in a future unfriendly world, <laughs> post-apocalyptic, right? Yeah. Where players can be clan leaders managing a camp of tanker, truck, and seven explorers. So, yeah, that it looks really neat. Um, I want to say it's almost like a real-time push your luck. Like, that's the best way I think I can describe it. Yeah, no, I, I hear you on that one. It's interesting, uh, something that I'll look into playing somewhere down the line, but like I said, I don't really play a lot of uh, two-player games anymore because the wife doesn't really want to play board games anymore. Right. Yeah, I don't blame you. So this would be between you and I, probably. And yeah. Oh, man, yeah, it looks it looks super cool. Whoa, jumping around like crazy here. All right, 
Um, it's by Hurricane, which is a newer uh, publisher, but art by Piero, which I believe is Z Garcia's favorite artist. Little yeah. side tidbit of info. All right, Home Alone game. Know nothing about it, but it's rated no, a six point six. I've actually heard really good things for and for for me. I like to try to have holiday games. Like I want a Christmas game. So Gingerbread House for me gives me not the best Christmassy feeling, but I probably play that around the table around Christmas time. Horrified, of course, is a Halloween game. So I I want to dig into this. I've heard decent reviews on it. Yeah, I have not looked into it at all because it just seemed like it was going to be one of those IP. This was right, right before IPs were, were we're, convincingly we're good. Because go. at the time, the only time you actually paid attention to IP games is with Fantasy Flight was doing it. If you saw it in a mass market store, you ignored it. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's jump ahead. Here comes Disney Villainous, the uh, one that really set it on the map for most of us. Disney Villainous. Yeah. Uh, do you want to take describing it? Uh, sure. Uh, Disney Villainous, for uh, for all those who haven't played it out there, is a game where you're playing as a villain from a, a Disney movie, whether it's old uh, old time or the newer generation or the current generation. And you each, and it's asymmetric, so every villain has their own way they want to win. So if you're Prince John from the Robin Hood films, you want to have the most powers. However, if you're Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty, I want to say, you want to curse every territory. You want to have all four areas cursed. And it's action selection, so you have to move your pieces back and forth on your board, basically get, doing different actions. There are fake cards where you can interact with the other players, but mostly you're just playing against yourself, trying to get your win scenario. There's, what, four expansions now? One... To Dr. There's three expansions. Three There's expansions, the base yeah. plus three, and soon and to be a Marvel there's version, be a right? New, yeah, a Marvel version, a new reskin of it uh, for Marvel coming this year, I think. Yeah, I mean that. <laughs> I know you're excited about that. I'm okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm somewhat excited about it. I want to try it. Don't get me wrong, and I'll probably end up buying it anyways. My only issue is I wish it integrated with Disney Villainous. There's certain things that they changed in that version that won't integrate with the Disney Villainous. Right. Yeah, that would be great to battle, I don't know. Like, like, like have Melissa, F Melissa F go against Thanos. That, yeah. That would be just interesting. That would be hilarious. Um, maybe it's like a license reason that they couldn't do that, but I don't know. Um, yeah, this is the game that really put it on for us because of the artwork as well as the the little miniatures that you have. They're nice, don't get me wrong, but the artwork, it's individually drawn art yeah. per card. And graphic so, design and everything. Yeah, and so they don't they didn't screen they, they could have easily screen capped it like most people do with it when they're dealing with IP. Instead they made the art for the game, especially the newest expansion. The and I showed it one time on our video here. The P cards. It's a black and white cartoon. How are you going to make that look good against this very colorful game? And it, the, the art on that is amazing. Yeah, definitely. That So definitely check that out. It's a hard learning curve, though. That's the only problem. Very difficult yeah, learning curve. Very difficult for new people to pick up on it. All right. Uh, next one we have up is the Choose Your Own Adventure House of Danger. They've so far only made two of these. Uh, House of Danger and Evil of the... Or Battle of the Evil Power Master or something like that? Yeah, you're... Yeah. Um, yeah. I really dig this one, the Choose Your Own Adventure. It's literally the books turned into a board game. Yeah. It says you can play up to four people, and you can. I've oh, done it. According it's to Board easy. Game Geek, it's up to 99. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. You can play with as many people. You just need a strong reader. My thing is... Four would probably be the maximum I play with, just because of all the choices that you have to make, plus the checks. Right, exactly. So in this one, basically, without giving too, away too many spoilers, because there are spoilers in there, you have five chapters, and you're this uh, paranormal investigator. And you start not having some... Not a very some, good one. Not a very good one, and it pokes fun at that fact, right? <laughs> yeah. It jokes about it a lot. And basically you're sent to this house of danger, and trying to get in to figure out what is the source of all these crazy dreams you're having. Um, each chapter is individually packaged. Each chapter's worth of regular cards is packaged as well. You have a board, a die for skill checks, which I actually, it's, I mean, it's fairly random. It's very light, but I do like this method of rolling for the checks. So, for example, 
if my meter is at the very bottom, I just have to roll a three or higher to succeed in the check. And I have items that I can put towards failure. it. One is an automatic failure. But as the danger goes up, the harder it gets. But once it gets to a certain spot, you lose two points on your psychic scale, which is like the important scale. But then you drop back down to three. So there's a lot of room for error and it's not too diminishing if you do lose, which is fine. Yeah. A couple things I forgot to mention on Villainous as well. Um, it was a nominee for the 2019 Origins Award Best Card Game. Oh, as nice. As well as this game, Choose Your Own Adventure, was also nominated for the 2019 Origins Award Best Card Game. Very good. Uh, that's awesome. Um, I'm, we're going to take a quick break. About some of the games that we haven't played or I haven't played. But I'm digging into um, Big Money. Because it actually looks... It's a dice economic game. Yeah, it's its similar to Yahtzee. And like you're rolling combinations. I actually own this one if you want to try it. It is pretty darn fun. Um, yeah, and super shiny box cover. It's really silly. Let's yeah, just... So you jump past uh, the Brady Bunch party game, the Boombox game, and Bob Ross Little Happy Accidents. Well, see, I've talked about those. You weren't here to listen to it. <laughs> Oh, my apologies. I, I, haven't, I, I probably won't try the Brady Bunch party game because I don't like the Brady Bunch or the people involved in it. Right. Which is uh, fair. The Boombox game I knew nothing about. Uh, Bob Ross, Happy Little Accidents. I want to try Hard to Chill before I dig into Happy Little Accidents. So, Happy Little Accidents is a very different game. From what I understand, it's similar to... Um, there's a fake artist that goes to New York. The Oink game. Uh, where everybody's contributing to the same piece and you're trying to figure out who the one person who doesn't know what it is is the player. I think that's how that works. Uh, I also um, talked about Black Mirror Nosedive, a game mm -hmm. that I'm not familiar with, and I don't watch uh, the show Black Mirror, so it's not something that really intrigues me. Right. It's uh, rated I, really lowly, too. It's a yeah, 4.7. Another one that I haven't, or I kind of glanced on was Beardball, and then I started looking at Big Money. <laughs> okay, Beardball. I haven't even heard of that one. It looked 4.5 rating on Board Game Geek. Yeah, that's pretty rough. Um, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to play it. Big Money was pretty fun, though. Um, it does have uh, some great components. I also jumped ahead of ways uh, and went to Kenny G Keeping at Saxe. We might go back to it when we get there, but uh, that's the more recent of the games on this list that I've actually played. Okay. Or earliest, uh, huh? <coughs> yeah. So, yeah, Big Money. I wonder if it has any pictures. Yes, it does. Cool. Yeah, so Big Money is very simple. You're trying to roll dice combinations. Um, you can buy stock in different companies where, that will trigger automatically or different combinations will get you different amounts of money, which will let you buy more cards, which will let you get more money for that stock. Um, I, th I don't remember exactly how, I think it's whoever has the most money when all the cards are, are complete is the winner. It's, it's surprisingly fun. Yeah. I mean, if you don't invest no, in the stocks, you can't win though. That's, that's the one thing you have to remember. Yeah, the only thing is, uh, another part of it is, I'm not really relying on you, uh, other than, you know, you keeping me floating here by myself. You have the screen share, so I'm talking about games, and they're still looking at the, the, the what you, screen you're sharing. Right. <laughs> yeah. So probably just there like, did it freeze again? What happened? <laughs> Are we getting chat messages? I'm not sure. Uh, no, we haven't. Thank goodness. Okay. Uh, so the recording will still be fine. But yeah, like it's a big golden cup. The pieces are really ridiculous. It's it's no, pretty cool. No, my question is, is it paper money or is it those, the, that money cards? It's paper money. But they are the size of like like jumbo cards. or it, It's absolutely ridiculous, the components <laughs> that are in it. It's they There's completely over the top. I mean, you're, you're dealing in ones, fives, and ten, ten zillion dollars. <laughs> I mean... Like, it, it's it's ridiculous. And so, yeah, because uh, the thing is, you want to become a zillionaire. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Which pokes fun <laughs> at that good. whole idea. Yeah, it, the the whole thing doesn't take itself seriously. It looks really cool. Uh, Beardball, yeah, I have not heard of that. That doesn't sound like one that I would... I, I'm pretty sure I could figure out the game just by looking at the cover. Yeah. Uh, the next one on the list here is Treasure X Quest for Gold. Uh, haven't even heard of that one. Yeah, so neither have I. Can't really, can't really describe if I want to play it or not. I think but I've seen I, this one. The, the one I do want to talk about and the one I do want to play is uh, the Trapper Keeper game. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely pull that up next. Yeah, I mean, because I want to say, 
I've seen this in the stores and I can't help but compare it to like they, they sell like these little blocks of uh, ceramic or or like chalk basically and they ha put gems inside of it and it's one of those like collectible things it's like one out of every hundred packages will have like a real piece of gold in it you know well, one thing it's actually under a category of a children game so it looks like Prospero Hall made a children's game yeah which I mean quite uh, a few of these could be compared a, to and it's an exploration so play cards to explore a map reveal the buried surprises don't let X's steal your treasure yeah. so basically it's Dora the Explorer and you don't want Cypher to steal your treasure <laughs> that's fair Alright, let's talk about Trapper Keeper. What do you know about it? It's a set collection game. Uh, if I remember correctly from some of the the things. So what happens is you're going to have like a stack of cards and it's going to be like in a grid that you can pull from one stack and so sometimes they're going to have shapes so you want to get the most shapes, that's going to give you the most points. If you pull up the, um, I think it's the third picture uh, once you get there. Yeah, it's going up right now. Uh, so you, you have these piles here, and the thing is, you the way that, um, once that picture shows up, I can tell uh, people, uh, the, you can grab in a certain way. So you're going to have to set up the cards in a 3x2 three by, uh, three by grid. And so I believe, if I remember correctly, the red ones are the ones that you're going to end up grabbing out of that section. And so what's going to have like the top card of each of those decks? It's going to have homework, and it's going to have symbols on it, like doodles, that if you match doodles, they're going to be worth points at the end of the game. If you have so much homework, um, that's going to give you stuff. you got to be careful. You don't want the detention notes because that's going to be negative points at the end of the game. And the, the um, what is it, The uh, there's like homework assignments or uh, slips, uh, sig parent signature slips. If you start collecting those, uh, there are going to be points at the end of the game. Quizzes are going to be points. So there's, there's different types of things that you want to get collections for. And what's cool about it, it all comes in a Trapper Keeper case, which I know I complained about it with, yeah, blew it because of the, the random boxes. <laughs> but I remember having a Trapper Keeper when I was in school. So it's kind of cool. It's the Velcro and everything. It's all kept in there. But then you each have your own individual folders. And the thing is, when you grab these cards, you're either going to put them on the left side or the right side, and they're going to score you depending on what is shown on each side. So your left side is going to score you all your quizzes and stuff like that, but the doodles on the left side are going to give you your points, as well as the doodles on the right side are going to give you points depending on which pocket of the Trapper Keeper folder you put it in. That's interesting. Okay. Huh. So it's kind of like tableau building in a way. Or... Yeah, it's tableau building, uh, set collection, you're trying to get the most points, basically. School the competition. <laughs> I like that pun. That's phenomenal. All right. Yeah. I mean, I I'd be interested to try this definitely. If you I'm if you ever pick it up, let me know. Yeah. No. I'm I'm planning on it. I just haven't found it. Uh, it used to be at Target, but I haven't seen it there in a while. Yeah. I don't. So I'm gonna look for it like online. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with you. I just don't ever remember seeing it. But that's that's just me. <laughs> All, All right, right, so next, next one game on the list Toy is Story. something that you own. Obstacle and Adventures. Yes, I do. Proudly so, because this is um, really just a great implementation. This It's a remake of the uh, Harry Potter, Harry Potter Hogwarts, Hogwarts battle. Yeah, but I like the theme on this way better and what they've done to change it. If you don't know how to play Harry Potter Hogwarts battle, go check out a video on how to do that. Uh, it's a deck builder, but it's all cooperatively and it goes through a series of adventures. Style. Yep. A series of adventures. Each one adds more mechanisms, new rules, and some interesting changes to it based on the story. And you have to basically go through the movies and complete the adventure before the time runs out, which is whichever one it is. Like, for example, you have to get to the new house before Andy moves in the first one. Mm -hmm. So it's a very simple deck builder, but what it does is so solid. Kids can play it, no problem. My kids don't like Toy Story all that much, so we haven't got it back to the table yet, but... For shame. I know, I need to fix that. <laughs> They'd probably rather play Harry Potter, but... Um, which no, I've played I the adventure most Harry of the Potter way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can understand how some people would say so. I disagree, yeah, but Daddy, that's just me. You're wrong. You, you're entitled <laughs> to your wrong opinion. As always. Alright, let's jump ahead. We have... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Ninja Pizza Party? 
Never played it, honestly. Never heard of it, to be honest. Nor have I. And I'm a huge Ninja Turtle fan. In fact, you don't see it, but I'm drinking out of a Ninja Turtle mug for my coffee today. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember seeing this one in the stores. I don't remember seeing it, and it doesn't have a very good rating on it either. It's no. got a four. Yeah. I'm actually pulling it up just to get a quick... Uh, it's the Ninja Pizza Party, right? Because there's the yep. tin one, and then there's the actual game. So I'm looking at the game. Oh, oh. Yeah, you're putting together slices of pizza from cards. Yeah. Uh, equal to one less than the number of players, except a two-player. Are randomly chosen, the players go through all their stack of pizza slices one at a time, each either adding the slice to their pizza or discarding it. Once they run out of cards in their stack, they take the discard pile from the player to the right and use it as their new stack of slices. Alright, I, I can see why it's not doing well. This this is not intriguing me at all. Yeah, it really doesn't. And of course, like, because it's, uh, immediately because it's an IP game, I'm, I, I want, I'm still in the process of going, ugh, I don't, I don't like IP games because uh, I haven't seen many. But, at that too, so. Yeah. Uh, squeeze, squeeze animals, or squeeze animals, freeze and squeeze adventure game. We're just going to skip past that. Let's go to Skulk. Own this one. I do own Skulk. Um, I haven't played it yet. I believe it's it's basically a bluffing game where you're pulling marbles out of the skull. Like his the mouth is actually a marble dispenser. As weird as that sounds. Um, because the way you open his mouth will, will give you one of the random marbles. It's a bluffing game, but you're trying to get a set of certain marbles in order to win. So you can see the mechanism being used on this picture here. The graphic design is really awesome. It has like this very um, 3D polygonal style as if it was from a really retro futuristic movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so... It looks interesting. I mean, um, again, it's another one of those oddly shaped boxes that just it's hard like this one this one's easy to store everything because everything just fits in the skull right uh sometimes my skull is currently hit sitting open uh it it's if you want to keep everything in in ziploc bags it gets very difficult ah uh, okay but yeah so um it's, this one's interesting and you could just kind of put it on the top shelf and just let it sit there but uh, and the skull is a decent size. Um, from these pictures, they make it look a lot smaller than it actually is. Yeah. No, it's 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 all right sized. I mean, it's smaller than a human skull, but... Well, yeah. <laughs> I but I'm saying for what you would think it would be, it's actually... Because it, this guy's got a really... Uh, the, the hand, the picture's on there. The hand makes the skull look smaller than it actually is. Yeah. No, it, it's it's significant size. It's like a, it's like a grapefruit. <laughs> The, but that's the best comparison. It, you do own it. Yep. So we'll have to try it, even though it is bluffing now. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of bluffing games. Well, so what I understand but about I'm the trying. way this the way this works is, um, so you're trying to get like certain colors on your on your little displays here. The thing is, you take out the marble and you have to you have to uh, you you only bluff about what color you took. That's the only part of bluffing as well. So you could continue going and, and still get some, or, or people might call you on it. It has been a while since I've read the rules, and I have not played my copy yet. But it will get to the table on one of these days. Alright, the next game on our list here is Ramen Fury. Yes, which comes in a ramen package. Um, I have owned this one. I was probably the first one in this town to buy it. When you pull it out, it's in a deck box that looks like a brick of ramen noodles. It is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. The, the graphic design in this is really fantastic, and just every approach that they took to it. The only thing is, you're trying to get points, and each of the cards score in different ways. So, like, uh, you have to have a sugar uh, sugar packet. You have to have a flavor packet, as well as different ingredients, depending on what kind of ramen you're trying to fill. The, the better, or the, the flavor packets give you the scoring, the cards themselves give you the ingredients for what you need. So for example, shrimp flavored ramen might want vegetable or tofu or might or an equal combination of each. Beef ramen wants meat, of course. Um, spicy sauce flavor. There's, they score in different ways. And so it's a set collection game. You have a number of bowls that you're going to be loading these cards onto. 
and then once you eat them, you score them. It very simple. Um, I ended up getting rid of my copy. I didn't like it that much. Understandable. I, for me, um, I think a big part of it for you is it's a take that. There's take that aspects in it. There just is. Wanting you to be mean. It's not too bad, and that doesn't bother me that much. Um, it's just. Oh, that, that's your biggest complaint for every game. No, my my biggest complaint with this one specifically was that if if you don't ever draw. Because you draw random cards. If you never draw flavor packets, you can't score your stuff at all. Oh, okay. And there's no real way to mitigate that necessarily. It's it's unlikely, but it's it's a very big thing. Like, if I draw the beef flavor and I never draw meat, well, then shame for me. You know, and it's okay. It's a short enough game. It's light. It's not bad. It's just it's... I didn't enjoy it all that much, so I ended up getting rid of my copy. All right, next up on our list here is a bunch of games I've never even heard of or played. Pinnacle, huh? Yeah, I have not yeah. heard of that one. Let's, let's, we can see what it is. Ogre Under, I've seen that at um, Barnes & Noble. And Make It Dirty, the game of familiar films made filthy. I think we're just going to skip that. It has one yeah. rating, and it's a rating of one. One. So, I mean, that that's okay. We'll, we'll let it stay that way. We're probably not going to read it. Me. King Me, which I have heard, it's like a variation on checkers with like abilities. Also kind of intriguing. Rated pretty oh, well. On. Go to Pinnacle. That game is intriguing. I'm just it's a dexterity game and I, I just clicked on it and Okay. It is strategic stacking leads to precarious peaks. In Pinnacle, players take turns stacking wooden blocks of various shapes to create a perilous pile of laughter and risk taking fun. If the shapes fall, the game ends. Ideal for players of any age who love a tactile and fun experience. Hmm. So it's a dexterity game, and you're actually, st and it's, it's, some of the pieces are actually really nice on it too. Yeah, I mean the, see the thing is with this, I don't see what the difference is between this and something like uh, junk art, or any other shape stacking game. Since <laughs> there has been many. Oh yeah, well it's Prospero Hall. That's my difference. Yep, that I mean that's probably a big enough difference, right? Yeah. Yeah, these pieces do look neat. I wonder why some are a little different shaped or different color than others. Maybe you have to put yours on a specific height. Yeah, it doesn't really tell us a lot that's going on with it here. Uh, and there's not a lot of pictures. So I don't even know where this is being sold. I, I Apparently I can find it on Miniature Market based on what the ads are saying. But I've never even heard of this game. Hmm. Yeah, neither had I. Well, let's jump over to Ogre Under from Mixed Lore is the publisher um yeah mixed lore this i mean that immediately is a play on the idea of over under where i know that's a classic almost like war game you you throw down a number if it's a nine or is the next card going to be over or under that and you have to kind of accurately guess it so it says let's see here ogre under each player contain controls a merchant and a donkey <laughs> who are transporting goods across an ogre-infested bridge. Headed for the market in the city, each round, players select an action card from their hand and then simultaneously reveal them. Action cards allow players to perform one of the following actions. Flip over one of the eight bridges, protect the merchant, move the donkey forward, uh, bet on whether the next market price or bet on the next market price to be revealed is over or higher or lower than the current one, which is probably the main mechanism you'd use. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So I almost wonder if this is something similar to like a uh, like group push your luck, like ink and gold. Maybe. Uh, it's, it, well, we all have our own merchants, so it's, it's a possibility. Yeah. Because it's simultaneous action selection plus the betting and bluffing under its mechanism. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's interesting. It really is. Um, but yeah. I don't know if I'd play it myself. I'm not a real big fan of over-under type games. Yeah, neither am I. But, I mean... Then again, it's Prospero Hall. It's Prospero Hall. All right, let's talk Kenny G, keeping it sexy. I touched on it briefly on your little break, but... Okay. So, yeah, we'll just talk about it very quickly then. It's a cooperative game. It is very simple. You're just trying to play cards to keep uh, Kenny G's groove going groove. throughout uh, ungroovy things throughout the day. It's very simple. Get the cards to the players who need it. We definitely weren't even close to losing. No, it's a, it's a real simple game, and that's why I was saying earlier that it's not something I would own just because, for me, it's, it's too simple. 
Yeah, I'm still debating whether mine's going to stay in its collect in, the, in my collection or not. Because then at the end of the game, if you win, which is really likely, then you rank yourself on how many points you have. I mean, it's fun. It pokes fun at itself. It doesn't take itself seriously. And it's decent components. But I don't know how long I'm going to keep it in my collection. So the next game on our list here, you haven't played, but I have. Our mutual friend of ours actually owns this game. And it's Jaws. Jaws. There we go. It's slowly loading on my end. There we go. And to me, this is actually a really, really good... Uh, it plays in two parts. So you have... And you can play each part as its own game if you want to, or you can combine it to make it one overarching uh, story. So if you click on the... Let's see here. The one, two, three, four... I guess the fifth picture. Uh, yeah. When you get it to open... It's, um, this is the hidden movement part of the game. One person is playing Jaws while the rest of the group, it's one versus all. And, and it's a hidden move. This is the hidden move part of the game. So one person is playing Jaws and he's trying to go into the water areas and eat as many of the uh, beach uh, dwellers uh, as he can. I forget what they're called, like villagers or swimmers. Uh, swimmers, that's what they're called. And so he's going in through these things. And so if you notice, like, three is a big piece. So three is actually adjacent to one, as well as seven in W. So west, east, there's coordinates as well as sections. And the hunters are trying to go out there and track. Um, so if you notice the little boats here, or the little people. So the little black maple, his job is he's trying to get these barrels that have sensors on them out to the, the people on their boats, uh, or the... I guess that's the brown boat. Uh-huh. Uh, the one that's over in the eighth section. So he's trying to get barrels to him. They're trying to drop barrels in there because they have motion sensors. Because they're trying to find where Jaws is. Jaws is trying to move around the entire board uh, to eat as many swimmers as he has. Because if you go into the second game, depending on how many swimmers you've eaten before you're found or if you reach your max, Jaws has more powers and the, the hunters get less powers. <sighs> Okay. So this part right here is the hit of a trailer, and then in the second part is um, if you, I think it's like one of the first pictures, if that's the other side of the board, it's the actual boat. And so in that one, it is the second picture. Okay. And then that one is Jaws is trying to destroy the boat as well as attacking the people in there. So if he can either completely sink the boat or destroy uh, or eat all the, or damage all the hunters, because it's the three hunters from the movie, um, he wins. If the hunters are able to give Jaws uh, enough damage, I think it's like 20 or something like that, they win the game and they successfully defeat Jaws. So it plays in two different formats. You've got your hit of betrayer and then you got your straight attack. And you're playing cards... Hunters have special abilities. Uh, it's it's really intriguing. It's really neat, and I enjoyed the mess out of it. Very cool. Did you like both halves of it? I preferred the hidden movement part of it more than the second half, but I did enjoy the second half because um, what's going to happen is the the person or persons playing the hunters, they're going to have to try to determine where Jaws is. Uh, where he's going to come up. So there's, if you notice where it says A, B, C, those are the choices Jaws has to attack. So uh, he has to decide if he's going to go to A, B, or C. And so <clears throat> the hunters are trying to set themselves up as well. This way they can damage Jaws. If Jaws's attack uh, does hit, he destroys part of the boat. Whoever's in that section actually falls into the water, which means Jaws has a chance attacking them. Very cool. So it's it's intriguing. I prefer the hidden betrayer or the the hidden movement part of the game more, but this one is not that bad. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because I've heard that it's kind of polarizing. Like one player either yeah. like, or most players only like one of the halves. But that that's fine. I mean, if you like both, that's awesome. No, for me, the overall, I prefer the hidden movement, but it's very thematic when you think about it. Because Jaws is going around the island, um, eating all the swimmers. And then, after a while, the in the last act of the movie, spoiler alert, the hunters go after Jaws. And so, <laughs> it's very thematic to the actual board game film. And I actually really enjoy that. Alrighty. Awesome. And yeah, I definitely need to try this one. Let's jump ahead to Horrified. 
What's well, the next one? Uh, at nauseum about this game, so we're going to try to keep it short. Yeah, we'll keep it very short. Basically, the idea is that you have one, you have a number of monsters, up to the six different ones. You're all villagers in this town, trying to maneuver around, get the items to defeat the monsters in their various different ways. It is all cooperative. It is fairly simple. It's about the same weight as a pandemic. If you're familiar with Pandemic, this is not too much more different. Um, actually, I find this slightly easier than Pandemic, because only one bad card ever comes out instead of two. Right, exactly. Easier to beat, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I just like how every monster has its own mechanism. I mean, we have talked about this at Nauseam, if you're familiar with any of our other episodes. By all means, this is, this is getting so many awards. Also, yeah, so... I wouldn't be surprised if it was nominated for the Spiel. So... For its awards this game, it's gotten three Golden Geek Award nominations. It got thematic board game, family board game, and cooperative board game. As well as the 2019 Cardboard Republic Immersionist Laurel nominee. Wow. Yep, yeah, so, so a lot of pay a lot of awards already. And we're at, like, <laughs> 2019. Man, Prospera Hall comes out with a lot of interesting stuff. And the thing is, this came out late 2019. This came out in August 2019. Yeah, so it might be eligible for the spiel. Yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, Robinsberger does print it. So, um, and I like uh, if you go on to the actual thing, the mechanism, it's got action points, which is true. It's a cooperative game. Yep, uh -huh. dice rolling. Eh, yeah, there's dice rolling, but it's more bad stuff than anything, and they're actually different dice. Pick up and <laughs> deliver, because you are trying to pick up villagers and deliver them to where they need to yep. go. <laughs> Plus the items and stuff like that. Point-to-point -point movement, and let's see, there's two more on here. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say there is a solo uh, play, and there is variable setup, so. Yep. It's, it, to me, it's one of the most interesting games that have come out in recent years, just because of the theme and how it plays and how really good it is. Yeah, definitely. It looks like there's only been one edition, and it's in English, but it might have been in Germany, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see if it's if it's eligible. Yeah. All right. Uh, our next one. I haven't heard anything about this. It should win. Right. It should. Um. I have not heard anything about this, but I'm already curious. Curious. Havana dice. It says. It better not be a, a liar dice. So it says Havana dice is a stylish Cuban twist on the traditional bluffing game of liars dice, known as Duda. Uh, <laughs> Roll the dice and push your luck. Game that. That is at once fast paced and easy to learn. Uh, using poker dice and unique dice cups, players roll their own dice in secret before bidding on the number of dice under every player's cup. But if a bluff is successfully called, the, the bluffer loses the die. So poker chips act as wild dice. So apparently they have poker chips on some of the dice. Yeah, it looks like a very highly stylized version of Liar's Dice. Um, as much as I like Crossbarrel Hall, I'm not a fan of Liar's Dice. It's one of my least favorite games. Yeah, I remember that. Alright, let's jump up to Funkoverse then. I'm, I'm curious in Havana Dice. That, that gets me excited. As you can see here, there is a lot of Funkoverse. Yeah, a so lot under of Funkoverse. the very, very tippity top, there's the, or not the, right under Friends of the Feather is the actual game itself. Yep. Alright. I mean, what what can we say about this that we haven't said yet? Um, it's interesting that you can have the Golden Girls face off against Batman. <laughs> right? <laughs> My favorite is the Kool-Aid Man. He breaks holes in walls, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, um, you have the my Funko... Only, my only issue is the Funkos. That, that's my only issue with this game. I can't stand Funkos. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the game system itself is really good. You have all sorts of different... Uh, varieties. You have Rick and Morty. You're gonna get. You have Back to the Future. Uh, I hear Game of Thrones is coming soon, which uh, I'm very excited about. Um, That'd be intriguing. Uh, there's gonna be a Jurassic Park version. I think it's just coming out now, rolling out now with the Raptors. Yep. So this is the very first uh, Funko game that I'm aware of. Uh, they we'll they be probably had others. Another one at the very top here that's coming out this year, but doesn't use the Funko Pops. Right. Exactly. But I have my windows jumping around here. Sorry. There we go. It's all good. Is this one of the main ones? 
they are based out of Seattle, okay? And it looks like they only have created, so far, the Funkoverse strategy game. But I know they are coming out with the Back to the Future soon. <laughs> Let's see here. What does it say? Oh yeah, there's Jaws as some of the characters that I need to get a hold of. Jurassic Park looks fantastic. Uh, Godzilla Tokyo Clap. Hold on, hold on. What? We will look at that here in a minute. Hold on, I think I'm looking you're at... frozen on stream because it's just showing me the the Funkoverse page. Alright, that's fine. Yeah, it's delayed, I'm sure. We'll look at some of their games later because if it's from Funko Games, it's going to be Prospero Hall. Oh, yeah. So, we're definitely going to have to look at that. There we go. Um, it's a great strategy game. If you're familiar with any other tactics skirmishes game, um, Unmatched is a good comparison. This that's more. This is more random than Unmatched, for sure. But, like, oh, yeah. Crossmaster was another good example. Another game I didn't like. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Friends no, of a wrong. Feather. I didn't like Crossmaster. I enjoy Funkoverse. I just, the, the Funko Pops are just kind of creepy to me. Yeah. Uh, Friends of a Feather, this is a children's game where you are putting feathers on the birds, which are card holders, and the feathers are cards of different colors. So you can see right here, that as this is loading, you have all sorts of different kinds of cards. I mean, it's a kid's game. That's the point. And you want to get sets of cards, I believe. So, rated a 9 from probably one user, but that's okay. Looks cute. Looks cute, yeah. Never played it. Yeah, if my kids Never were at that it. age, then maybe I'd consider it. Uh, let's see here. Let's go up a little bit more. The Fanny Pack game. One second, real quick. Looks like you're frozen on Twitch, just so you know. It's still on the Funkover strategy game. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're just going to have to keep trudging through. Right, it just it just jumped to Friends of a Feather, so yeah. hopefully... Uh, it's just, it's running real slow now. Yeah. The Fanny Pack game, rated a 4. I have seen this at stores. It's basically like an 80s cultural referen cultural reference game. Don't Sweat It. I have not heard of this one. Have or you heard of I? Don't Sweat It? Yeah, it doesn't even have any ratings on it, so... I've never even heard of this. I've never even seen this. Yeah. Then we have the Disney Villainous Expansions, which... If you've heard us talk about Disney, then easy. Don't sweat it. Let's look. It looks like those are sweatbands. Yeah, those are like sweatbands. Huh? It looks like a uh, like a party game that makes you move. Yeah. Don't sweat it. Is the party game of mis mismatched moves? Go head to head. Hilarious challenges feature one over one hundred classic dance moves and pop culture poses. Yeah, I'm going to have to pass on that one. Yeah. Personally. But. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, that's okay. I don't even think it's been released in the, the U.S. No, it doesn't look like it. Because the only thing I'm seeing, like, on the geek market is in the Netherlands. It doesn't even look like it's been released here. Yeah. Destroyer of Words, which I have not heard of. Nor have I. Decent ratings. At, I mean, it's only got seven, but it's got at an 8.5, so. Yeah. Uh, choose your own adventure, War with the Evil Power Master. So, I played the first round of this. I finally got it to the table. It is a very different game than the first what one. What I'm hearing is actually is very different compared to House of Danger. Yeah, my son ended up not liking it as much as, as the first one. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to keep getting it back to the table, but I might play this as a solo game. It is pretty neat. Basically, instead of chapters, you have nine different location decks. And each of those location decks, you're trying to boost your signal. You have to get to a certain boosted signal, uh, 25 specifically, before the evil power master gets his signal to 25. And so you only do that by, by going through different locations. There's 13 cards per location. There's nine different planets. And you have to know... It, it's kind of like a trial and error. It's more akin to something like uh, Time Stories. If you, if you think of it that way. Okay, understandable. Catlantis. We're going to skip past that. Um, <laughs> no. No, I mean, hey, this might be the second game. Well, I'll bring it up, but this might be actually the second game that I might enjoy uh, that has cats in it. 
Well, so far, there's only kitty one. Is the first one. Here Kitty Kitty is my only one. Yes. What about uh, Cat Lady? I heard that's actually a really good game. I have not played it. So, Catlantis. Become the leader of Catlantis in this clever game of trade off tre and treasures. No, Gather. I'm out. <laughs> bluffing and card game. Yep, gather wealth and treasures in a per and persuade allies to join your kitty coop. Each turn you make offerings to another player and hope they don't pounce on the resource you need. Trying to figure out what they ha want is half the battle. Whose reputation will sink in the seas and whose will float to the top. What it sounds like, you know, that immediately sounds like cockroach poker to me. Where I draw a card, I look at it, I hand it to you, or I hand it to somebody, if, and you can either choose to keep it or take it. Or, I'm sorry, keep it or give it back. I've heard good things about cockroach poker, cockroach poker so maybe this is good. good. I mean, I like the graphic design, I just really dislike cats, so, I mean, it's just, but I like this, the, the cat mermaid meeples, that's hilarious. Those are hilarious. <laughs> Okay, I'll give it that. That that so, that's intriguing to me. There's a few more games on this list here before we get to the the future games. Yeah. So there's Yacht Rock. Let's let's pull that up. I already I'm looking at that because it, I I like the way that looks. Yeah, it looks like a vinyl record. I uh, I'm immediately curious. Let's see here. In Yacht Rock, you team up with others to write soft rock songs. Find the perfect floral print shirt and shades to complete your swanky look <laughs> and schmooze to success at yacht parties. Okay. So apparently it's a card game. Yep. It's by, and this is by Funko. This is why this is interesting. Is that the only picture from it? Uh, just the, the very front. Yeah, it's the only picture on it. I don't think this has been released yet. Yeah. Um, so I think they just go by the years. They don't go by the actual date or the actual date. Right. Much. So some of these might not even be out yet. In fact, uh, no one owns it on the community stats. It's on 15 people's wish list. Yeah, I, I'm it's, curious. Uh, yeah, it's not showing anything when it's going to come to store. So. Right, it's probably I'm Storm Talk. just by the cover alone. Yeah, yeah, as a big Beach Boys fan myself. I, I hate Beach Boys. You hate Beach Boys? I hate the Beach Boys. What did they ever do to you? I don't understand. They made crappy music. Eh, music's fine. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, Challenge and, uh, of the Amazons. That's our next one. <laughs> the Eagles. It kind of gives me that Eagles vibe. You don't like Eagles? Oh, I love the Eagles. Then what's the problem? <laughs> I hate the Beach Boys. Ah, uh, sometimes. All right. Uh, <laughs> the Wonder Woman, Challenge of the Amazons. I've heard good this things about one. this. I don't... Oh, it is out. I just yeah. haven't played it myself. Yeah, neither have I. Only what we've heard of it. Let's jump to the page here. It's a cooperative game, Wonder Woman Challenge of Amazons. You strategize together to face your foes on the battlefield and rise to meet the challenge of one of three classic Wonder Woman enemies, Ares, Cersei, or the Cheetah, each with their unique gameplay. Maybe similar to uh, to something like Horrified. Sounds almost like... Yeah, for the board actually almost looks like it too. Yeah. So maybe, maybe. It's probably... I mean, I'm intrigued. I like Wonder Woman. I, I'm a big comic book nerd. I'm not going to lie. I like that the minis are bronze to make them look like statues, like uh, classic statues. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I see a lot of tokens and stuff. Okay. Well, I mean, I would try it. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, I might pick it up. Let's go to... Uh, I mean, look at some reviews on it, but... Sure. It looks really yeah. nice. Top Gun strategy game just came out this year. This is another no, one I of those. I haven't seen this at Target. I just haven't tried it because I'm not a big fan of the, the franchise. Neither am I. I mean, I, I I saw one review on it and it was pretty pretty scathing. Of course, Dice Tower. Um, because you play two halves of the game. One is a miniatures battle game, which he liked. But then the first half of it, you play volleyball. Volleyball. <laughs> which, I mean, was one scene, wasn't it? Yeah, it's like a scene in the movie. I, mind you, I haven't watched the movie in, in ages, so I'm not too, too familiar with it. Yeah. Me, personally, um, the big reason why I'm not a big fan of Top Gun is it has an actor that I cannot stand. I've only liked one, maybe two of his movies that he's made, and this was not one of them. Gotcha. Uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, yeah. Um, 
I'm not even going to try and guess, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like the I mean, graphic I'll, design on this. If someone picks it up and I'll try it, yeah, I'll try it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's what I want to play. Right. Yeah. No, it looks all right. I, I might try it. It is for one to four players. or Is that a one or a two? Eh, it's hard to tell. Two to four players. Must be. It's probably two or four players. Yeah, probably. Two teams. So, the next one on the list we've talked about, you own. Yes, The Shining. Very awesome game. Very simple. Uh, not difficult to learn how to play. The idea is that you're walking around on the board trying to get the right kind of tokens to deal with the Shining cards at the end of your at the end of the turn. Every player has a certain certain number of shining cards that are dealt out in front of them uh, or I'm sorry dealt face down in front of them and it gives a range of what how much they are so it's anywhere from like one to five two to four three to six whatever and that's how difficult they are to deal with you as a group can either edge your bets and hope that they're lower numbers or you can get enough to guarantee a victory against it but that's inefficient because if you don't meet your shining goal at the end of your turn, you go crazy and start attacking other players, yeah. <laughs> which is awesome. Um, I, this is based off, just for everybody to know, this actually is based off the movie rather than the book. Right. Yeah, definitely. So you can see there's certain screenshots that, that are based very heavily on it. Um, it also comes with a keychain for room 237, which is the best start player marker just about. All you have to do is survive four full rounds of it, and then you win, which are divided into months. Uh, I have won this every time I've played it. It's not too difficult, but it is really enjoyable. And I think that's the key for Prospero Halls. They want to make games that... Now, this one is rated for a uh, higher audience, but they want to make games for people that are not into gaming, not the hardcore gamers. So right. they don't want to make it too difficult for people to play it. Exactly. Exactly. But overall, it's a very positive game. I, I enjoy it. Um, there is S'mores funny, Wars. The, under the, sorry, go ahead. Uh, if you look under the classifications, it has author Stephen King. I want to see them bring more Stephen King books to life under Prospero Hall title. Right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. He would do good things for it, I think. So these must be announcements. So we have stuff like Pan Am, S'mores Wars. I mean, I love s'mores, so I'm probably definitely going to get this. It's probably I'll just... Yeah, it looks like you're just trying to get different types of cards, set collection. You need graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallow cards. So there, there is a couple games on here that I'm pulling up that I want to talk about that has me intrigued. Uh-huh. Um, not the Funkoverse. I'm going to skip past those. Uh, we, oh, we've we already talked about Perfectly Wretched. Uh-huh. Or, but, yeah, so I pulled up the games that I want to talk about that are coming out. Um, but we'll go ahead and just go through the list as it is. Yep. So the Pan Am. Know nothing about it. I think it's a TV show. No, Pan Am is a is a the airlines it says in yes, Pan Am. Pan Am is a TV show. There was is it's it canceled after like two seasons or something like that. Well, let's see what the description is. Uh, players compete with Pan Am Airways to and others to build air an air travel empire. Outbid rivals for lucrative landing rights. Buy planes with longer range to reach fan to reach the far corners of the world and use insider connections to advance your interests. As you bump up against an ever-growing Pan Am, you can sell your routes to the companies and earn a tidy profit. With They're your... making a, like an acquire-style game. It's a, yeah. a mechanism to say it's stock holding, auction bidding, with worker placement. So as much as the auction bidding uh, annoys me, the worker placement and the stock holding intrigues me. Yeah, exactly. That's That's intriguing. Then we have Marvel Villainous Infinite Powers, which we've heard of already. We've already talked a little bit. Uh, Last Defense. Let's see what that is about. And while I'm at it, I will pull up a couple others. Now, we didn't talk too much about the expansions for Funkoverse, but there's so many of them. Uh, like right here, it shows Kool-Aid Man, Jurassic Park. We did briefly talk about those. And, and along the, the, the thing with the Funkoverse, same thing with the Villainous. It just adds more of the same. Right. Exactly. So it just adds more of the same. Let's see what... Yay, my web browser is going slow. Alright, last defense. You have 20 minutes to save the city. Mm. You have just 20 minutes to save the city in this family-friendly cooperative game. Uh, cooperative dice rolling. Players team up as a band of unlikely heroes to face monstrous threats. From space aliens to spider robots to oozing building-sized blob. Roll dice 
each turn to determine how far you can move and how many actions you can take. You can take with one reroll available for those two dice. You know what this kind of sounds like? Huh. Fuse. Yeah, a little bit. It does say uh, it games does app audio. App. Yeah. yeah. 20 minutes. It You know, it might be inspired by Fuse, wouldn't it? I would totally yeah. believe that. And Interesting. This is another game that's coming through the Funko line. Yep. Which I now I think is all of them. Then we have uh, Tokyo Clash Godzilla, which not has necessarily because the Marvel villainess is coming still through Robinsberger. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So yeah. Oh wow. Ooh, what is going on with these minis? Hold Let's on. look. Hold on now, everybody. Everybody, calm down. Let's see. Why is Earth's most fearsome kaiju? Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, and Megalon battling for dominance as the most terrifying monsters in Japan. With detailed miniatures of the legendary monsters and a modular cityscape of 3D buildings to destroy in an epic battle every time you play. In more detail, each player has their own deck of cards unique to the kaiju they control as you throw trains and tanks at the opponents and attack them directly to cause damage. You can burn cards out of their deck, reducing their options on future turns. As you stomp through the city, you can earn energy, which can help you lay out permanent enhancements to your abilities. This kind of uh, says to me more of unmatched than their Funkoverse game because of the way the cards right. work. Yeah, definitely. That's what it's looking I, like. I am intrigued. I want to play this game. <laughs> I'm a huge right. Godzilla fan, first off. Yeah. That, that's... And those minis look amazing. They really do, don't they? Yeah, no, that, that looks pretty fantastic. I would definitely like to do that. Um, Perfectly Wretched, the expansion that we talked about a little bit. Um, Disney Jungle Cruise. What do you know about this one? I know nothing. I, I heard of it. Um, I because if I remember correctly, Jungle Cruise is actually a ride at Disneyland or Disney World, one of the two or both. Uh huh. But they're actually making a Jungle Cruise movie with Dwayne the Rock Johnson later this year, or next year now, because with everything, movies have been pushed around. So I wonder if this is going to take place to go along with said movie. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, everybody has their own boats. It looks like you're loading people on, going down the river cruise path. Interesting. Looks like dice, different character cards. Let's see what the description is real quick. So, the way it goes, the Disney Jungle Cruise Adventure Game is a mystery and deduction game based on the world-famous Disney Parks attraction. Players are intrepid skippers transporting valuable cargo and families of passengers through the jungle to Jungle Cruise Navigation Company headquarters. Along the way, they collect to see which family might be appointed company caretakers. These, messenger, uh, these passengers are worth more points at the end of the game. They'll also collect lost passengers and cargo and navigate dangers that cause passengers and cargo to get lost in the jungle. The skipper to transport the most valuable cargo at the end of the game wins. And the way it breaks it down, on a player's turn, they will roll a movement die and move their boat forward that many spaces. They draw four navigation cards, each of which has a danger rating and targeted boat section, as well as a dangerous encounter, including hippos, bu giant butterflies, and ducks. As appropriate, each navigation card also includes a pun. <laughs> Players only encounter as many cards as they move. Two cards for two spaces, for an example. They will roll encounter dice equal to the danger rating, 0 to 3, then remove one passenger or cargo for each exclamation point symbol they roll from the indicated boat section. If a player doesn't like their roll, they can use their warning shot to re-roll. On future turns, if there are empty spaces in their boat, players will be able to collect a lost and found token when they land on a river space. Lost and found tokens allow players to collect lost passengers or cargo. Players will also stop at outposts, which allow them to reload warning shots and collect cargo or passengers. Depending on their chosen route, players may also encounter clue spaces, which show one of the familiar not chosen by Alberta. When the first player reaches headquarters, they may collect the tip token. Once all players have arrived, the new caretakers are revealed, and the players add up their scores. Passengers belong to the caretaker, belonging to the caretaker are worth more. The player with the most points and most valuable cargo wins. There you go. That's an interesting game concept there. Yeah, like definitely. Like a roll and move with bad things and puns. And... Well, the puns is important because... Uh, so, clearly this is based off of the actual ride. It's not based off of the movie. Because the ride is... That was hands down known for it's just constant jokes. Um, I wouldn't know. Again, I haven't been to Disney, any of the Disney parks since I was five. That was 30 years ago. Yeah. Wow, you're showing your age. 
uh, no, it's it's really enjoyable. It's yeah, I went just about four or five years ago, and yeah, all puns, constant. Hocus Pocus. Oh, yeah, now, see, this is a game that has me intrigued. I love the Hocus Pocus movie. Me and the wife watch it every year in October for Halloween, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and to me, this is an intriguing um, concept because you're working to try to destroy the Sanderson sisters' potion. So it's a pattern building is what it's described under mechanisms. Um, okay. Do you have it pulled up? Do you want to read the description? I have the picture pulled up, but I can go back if you, unless uh, you want to read it. I can read it. I have it up. Okay. Uh, it, it's based on the 1993 movie Hocus Pocus. Players must work together to ruin the Sanders Sisters witch, a witch's potion three times before the sun rises. Players hold a hand of ingredients of different types and colors and attempt to match all ingredient types or colors in the cauldron. Each turn, players ask a question about other players' hands, a la Hanabi. To the ingredient type or the color. For example, who has blue ingredients or has nuked saliva? They then play a card from their hand into the cauldron and draw back up to three cards ending their turn. Some ingredients have Binks the cat or a spell book on it. When ingredients with Binks is played into the cauldron, the active player puts the Binks mover in front of any other player. That player then lays their cards down so that everyone can see them and keeps them there until Binks is moved. If a spell book is played, the active player draws a card from the spell book and resolves the card. Spells generally do something to ruin the player's plans. If you have cards showing all of one color or all of one object in the cauldron, then you've stunned one of the witches. Then you need to stun the witches three times before time runs out. When stunned, a witch cannot cast spells from the deck. Players have all f have four tricks to use based on the scenes from the movie. Each trick can be used once per game. For example, Burning Rain of Death allows you to discard three potion ingredients and draw three more. Very cool. So yeah, it's just a simple cooperative card game, right? Yeah, so it, it intrigues me, though, because, again, I want to see how they bring up the Hocus Pocus movie in this game. Yeah, definitely. I love the graphic design on this. It's, like, in a book, obviously. Like that. I've yeah. always liked games that are built to look like they're in books. That's enjoyable to me. And now, uh, the last one that we have listed. And the one we've both been excited to talk about. Yes, Back to the Future, Back in Time. Back in Time. Now, let's talk real quick about other Back to the Future games. Have you played you know, any so, of them? <laughs> I played, uh, I think it's like a, it's like a push your luck game. I can't remember what it was called. Yeah, so there's the board game um, from IDW fairly recently. I've, it, it, I've heard it's not bad, but it's not great because you're going between the timelines. And just the way it is, is kind of clunky and not very uh, friendly for users. But uh, the... The dice game I played one called Out of Time, and that was pretty decent. Yeah, it was it was kind of like a push your luck. It was like a set collection. You get certain number, certain amounts of dice into it. It was okay. Um, it wasn't anything to write home about. Yeah, exactly. It was it wasn't amazing. I had it for a long time. I liked the dice. The dice quality was really nice. But uh, any of the other games that we played for Back to the Future just haven't felt like Back to the Future. This one, I'm going to point out the fact that the clock tower, or the city hall, is a dice tower. Oh my god, I just yeah, noticed that I right now. That, yeah. <laughs> and not only that, this, uh, for our viewers and listeners, Back to the Future is one of my favorite series. I love all three movies, I watch them all the time. In fact, well, the year he goes into the future, um, which was 2015, they um, had a movie marathon at I want to say the um, one of our local theaters uh, in El Paso it's the big one with the alcohol I Alamo Draft House yep at the Alamo Draft House they had where they played all three and me and my wife were the first ones to sign up for it we that's like, awesome we're going 100% yeah no you you play as like one of four characters it is cooperative I believe yep. um, you're playing Only a good Fully, wholly cooperative, yep. It's a dice rolling game. Looks like the dice have different colors and symbols, which do matter. Uh, other than going over the brief, like, briefest explanation of what we've just heard about it. I mean, the components look good. It's Prospero Hall, so it, it, I, I have high hopes for this. And this IP has me truly, truly excited. I mean, the way this game is supposedly supposed to work from just the description we're seeing... Is it's the first movie you're trying to get back to the present time or back to the future in this case. Yeah. Um, so basically, how the first game or first movie works, you're trying to get to 
1955. You're in uh, 1955. You're moving around 1955 Hill Valley. To get to 85. You're trying to collect the items and get the DeLorean to go back to uh, uh, Marty's original timeline. Yep, 1985. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it looks awesome. <laughs> I, the fact other that it's than, not Funko Pops, but actual minis makes me so excited. Yeah, we need to, we should clarify that too, is that um, it is licensed under Funko, but that's because they have the licensing and they own Prospero Hall now. And I I read an interview and it seemed like, <laughs> like they kept asking, it's like, so Funko, you're saying this isn't compatible with Funko strategy game or this isn't made out of Funko mini? No. They designed their own minis just like they did in Horrified. It's just a Funko branded or published game. Yeah. But that's because Funko knows how to publish games now. Yeah. So, yeah, we don't need to belabor that anymore. But and, and, and I think the big part of it, too, with Funko is they realize not everybody's into Funko Pops. And if they want to be this big thing in the board game world, they have to get away from the Funko. It works for their, their strategy game. Yeah. But um, this kind of game, which looks amazing, has both of us intrigued. It does better if you do it as minis rather than Funko Pops, because that's going to detract people from it. Right. Exactly. Because then the, all the questions come up. It's like, well, can I combine my Back to the Future Funko Pops to it? I don't. Well, yeah. Can I do? No. Just we'll pass by that. So wait a minute, Doc. Are you telling me you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The photo of of the McFly. McFly family is slowly fading. It's 1955 and you're wrapped up in a time pa- paradox with Biff, Lorraine, George, and Doc Brown. Cooperate to move around the Hill Valley to get the DeLorean ready. Avoid Biff and his gang. Help George and Lorraine fall in love. And crank the DeLorean up to 88 miles per hour. All just in time for the lightning strike to, cl- to, st- or the lightning to strike the clock tower. Sending you back to the future. Fully cooperative. Game, Back to the Future, each player takes on the role of a major character from the movie. Uh, the objective of the game is to have the characters move around Hill Valley, 1955 Hill Valley, collecting certain items in an effort to fix Doc's famous DeLorean time machine, defeat Biff Tannen and his gang of troublemaking friends while ensuring Marty's parents fall in love. Only when that is accomplished can pay- players accelerate to 88 miles per hour down Main Street before the clock tower strikes at 10.04 p.m. Description from the publisher. Yeah, I... Out of all of the games that I've seen thus far, this is the one I'm easily the most excited about. And, yeah, which is a great note to end on, because that's the last one that we were going to talk about today. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, I'm, I'm hoping... I'm hoping the... Because if you go to, like, the concept pictures and stuff like that, the DeLorean looks like that. And the, with the silver, and actually looks like the DeLorean. I don't care... If the other minis aren't painted, they're just the different colors as they, as they are as, that it's showing in the pictures. I want the Dor- DeLorean to look like a micro machine. Right, exactly. They did say that that was going to be one of the minis. One of the minis. There's eight total minis. Seven of them are characters. One is the DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be pretty I just, great. I just wish I knew when it was going to come out. I'm thinking it's going to be their August release, like how horrified was. That's that's my guess. I would believe that. Yeah, it looks like it's coming out very soon. If not. If not, because it's supposed to be sometime this year, maybe before Christmas, it might be a Christmas release. It could be, and Hocus Pocus may be the, the August release, get ready for Halloween, like they did with War 5. Yeah, exactly. So we'll just have to wait and see. But with that being I'm said, I'm going to go to their actual website. You can do the ending. I'm going to the actual website for find the date. <laughs> All right, let me know if you find that. Uh, with that being said, this has been our board game breakdown. It's been a long one, but thank you for sticking in with us. This has been a really enjoyable video for us to look through. Um, this has been all about Prospero Hall and all of their designs. Uh, one thing I realized that we did not look through was the ones that from their art page. I don't know if they if there are any different games that we should. Yep, just Horrified and Push and Accessory Designer, Horrified Invisible Man Clear promo. I didn't know that was a thing. Now I want it. And the Orca Meeple promo. That's fun. <laughs> so I'm going to have to look for that now <laughs> set that up on my list and with that being said that has been horrified with us uh, or not horrified Prospero Hall games 
definitely one of the designers to look out for. Any new games coming up, you'll know that they'll be family to medium weight games uh, and doing the IP justice more mm -hmm. often than not. Still have room to fail, I guess, but at this point, there, there, I'm looking forward to it. There's some games in there where they're like, eh, but no, I... If they come out with something, I'm going to look into it, like, big time and be like, I want to try it. Yeah, definitely. So with that being said, hopefully you enjoyed watching this and our discussion about Prospero Hall games. Uh, please tune in on Wednesday when we are going to be having our uh, Chits and Giggles discussion post. And it is going to be about movies that we want to turn into board games. Speaking of Prospero Hall. And our top eight debate is going to be uh, Rio Grande Games. And that will be on Friday. So join us at noon, uh, Mountain Daylight Savings Time. And we will see you then.